Hey everyone, today on the podcast, Leroy Bodiford, sax player, musician extraordinaire. Um, I- I've played with and met so many people, but Leroy is really, he is just an expert at his craft. He he is incredible when he plays. He really puts passion and everything he has into his music. I thought it would be a really great opportunity to chat with him because, uh, like me, he's also from a very small town. Sometimes I think people from small places are really confused about if they can get into the music industry. Well, Leroy has a great career. He's toured with American Idol winner Ruben Studdard and shared the stage with other jazz artists such as Jeff Lorber, Rick Braun, and Brian Culbertson, and many, many, many others. He's a fantastic human and a, just an amazing musician and friend. Get ready for this great chat with Leroy Bodiford. It's me, Jilla Webb, your host of Walking with Porpoise, here with my guests to help you develop your foundation of purpose and fine tune the four pillars of success, practice, performance, presence, and peace. Let's get started. But I'm here today with my awesome friend, Leroy Bodiford, one of the most amazing musicians I know and have had the pleasure of working with. Leroy, thank you so much for doing this this afternoon. Oh, no. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, man. I, there's, I, I just appreciate everybody coming on and, you know, talking with me like we were just saying before the record button went live. You know, I really want to give my students and anyone who's in the industry um, a peek at, into the life of actual musicians who are out there doing it and making their their dreams and their passions come to life. So I appreciate you spending the time with me and then giving your advice and and thoughts to them. So this is, this is awesome. Absolutely. I'll do my best. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so give me a little bit of background on um, your career and where you started. Um, I know music has always been sort of a love for you and you grew up in Luverne. So that's a, did I say it right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I got to make sure I'm pronouncing yeah. it right. But it's a small town, right? So how did you get into it, music from being in a small place? Luverne <laughs> has, uh, let's see, Luverne has two, two or three traffic lights, I believe. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I'll tell you what happened. My, my band director um, noticed that. I don't know. I was talking to him and I was telling him that I, I used to stay up late nights and listen to the, um, well, when I was growing up, I used to listen to the Johnny, well, watch Johnny Carson, mm-hmm. Johnny Carson. So and very interested in that band. <laughs> and so when Jay Leno took it over, ran for Marsalis was running and I used to just sit there and just, you know, idolize ran for Marsalis. And right. he noticed I had uh, an interest in jazz And so, you know, I started out playing Barry Sax in the jazz band, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, so I used to go in there and I'd practice in the practice rooms and he'd hear me just messing around. And so (laughs) I was, I think one of the first solos I learned was a saxophone solo on Super Freak, Rick James. (laughs) Oh, that's great. That's awesome. (laughs) That was like the first one I learned. That's awesome. So I used to, you know, back then you could actually listen to the radio and hear saxophone solos and keyboard solos and stuff, but, uh, you know, mainstream stuff. But uh, so I used to just do that. And he heard me playing one day and he decided to put me on alto and, uh, you know, just allowed me he he gave me the opportunity to explore the instrument and explore the music you know he was a trumpet player and so he he didn't have a whole lot of uh like saxophone uh expertise as far as just you know the instrument itself but right he got me he let me see that i know i was in the eighth grade i think i mean the seventh or eighth grade and uh he uh, he took me to Troy University to mm-hmm. meet Ray Smith, Mr. Right. Ray, Smith. Mr. Ray. And, <laughs> yeah, so I went over there and 
Mr. Smith showed me how to play the blues scale. And that was my one and only lesson until I was probably in my 30s. Wow, really? So, yeah. Uh, so I used to just, you know, listen to the radio. And, uh, my first main influence as a saxophone player was probably uh, Gerald Albright. Oh, yeah. And I, I think I spent the better part of 15 to 20 years trying to play what he was playing. And that started when I was in the eighth grade. So much so that uh, I took... I say I had to save up my money first of all to buy to buy a CD. <laughs> right, so, yeah. <laughs> I bought my I bought my first Jared Albright CD, uh, and uh, there was a song on there called "Sea Jam Blues." Yeah, and I was so inspired by that song. I mean, it's, it's in you know it's a blues and sea. I was so inspired, and I learned the song, learned the solo, and I think I was in the eighth grade at the time, and. Uh, I was so inspired. I, I told Mr. Franks, my band director, I said, I wanted to arrange this song for the marching band so we could play it on the field. Oh, wow. He, he was like, huh? You want to <laughs> play, you want to play a jazz solo on the field during half? I mean, uh, yeah. Oh, that's like, great. Okay, what, what key is it in? I said, it's in C. Hell no, that's not going to work. You're going to have to change the key to B flat. For all the so horns, think, right? For all yeah, the different yeah, horns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think he he thought that I wasn't going to, you know, he probably thought that was going to, like, slow me down. And like, oh, he ain't going to do it. He ain't going to put the work in. But so I, my my stepdad uh, was a, he was a diabetic and had issues hearing and seeing and stuff. So I had to, uh, he had this, like, little tape recorder. Mm-hmm. that allowed you to slow down the sounds. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so so <laughs> I re- I recorded I recorded the song and it was in C, which the tape recorders used they made the uh key a little either high or low. Yeah. But I learned it in C. I learned every the whole like I learned the bass line, I learned, the, you know, the the solo, I learned the melody wrote it all out in B flat. And so I had to learn the solo in B flat. Oh jeez. Yeah, so I did it and uh we used to play that song on the field during halftime. That's amazing. <laughs> and so there was a little guy that used to cuz we <laughs> he used to have I think for rehearsal for practice he would bring the megaphone out there and hold it for me to play into oh, it. My but God. uh so so, you know, he set up a microphone up there and, and let me, I took like, I think it was, a, the solo was actually a three or four choruses. Wow. Yeah. And and, and so at Mr. first you played it into a megaphone so that the, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, yeah. Now, granted, I'm, let's see, I'm 43. This was back, I think I was in it. I, Either the eighth or ninth. It might have been the ninth grade. Yeah. Now. But yeah, I mean that whole my whole time in the middle school and high school, I was doing stuff like that just to kind of experiment. You know, um, I you know grew up in the country. I grew up uh, my my mom and my stepdad had a farm. They had cows and stuff. So yeah, I didn't uh, you know I didn't have a whole lot of. I had a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would sit there and just learn solos or try and imitate this saxophone player. Or, you know, back then you could listen to a, a really nice theme song on a TV show. And I just, any any music that I, that, that kind of drew me in, I try and learn, learn how to play. You know? Did you learn by ear or, I mean, you were clearly writing music. Where did the skill for writing music, were you taking music theory or... You would just listen uh, to this stuff and figure well, it out. Well, okay, so I I had a music theory class that I would take with Mr. Frank, right? Mm-hmm. But I didn't understand it. <laughs> 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 like I I totally fit. I probably failed that class. Like I just didn't understand what was going on. But uh, you know, 
by studying jazz, it's like you're studying theory all at the same time because right. you have to deal with chords and scales and where you put these scales and how to use these chords and blah, 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 blah. So I, you know, I have been studying that kind of accidentally. Yeah. You know, because when you're learning a solo, it's always good to learn the chords that the person's playing over to see what how the lines fit over that particular chord. That so kind of is that what what would you do first? Would you learn the solo and then learn the chords and look how they work together or vice versa? Or how did that work? Uh, a lot of the times, because I, I would learn the bass line first. Really? Yeah. I, I don't know what it is about bass lines. Mm-hmm. Even before... Even before I even thought to be in band, bass lines stuck out of my head. I don't know why. I remember riding the school bus and just humming bass lines to songs as a kid. So, I I mean, I don't know. Always bass lines first. And so once I figure out the bass lines or whatever, I could, uh, you know, I, I learned the song, learned the melody. And if it was a solo, usually with Gerald Albright or, I try and learn a Charlie Parker solo or two back then, but I didn't, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that. Yeah. That that's you know. daunting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. And honestly, so was, so was some of these Jared Albright oh, souls because, yeah. you know, he went up into the altissimo, the, the higher notes. A right. Lot. And, you know, I'm, I, like I said, I didn't have any saxophone lessons back then, but one, and I had to kind of learn altissimo on my own Mm -hmm. but you know i used to stay up late and watch saturday night live and listen to lenny pickett all the time so i (laughs) yeah yeah so so how many hours do you think in those early years like how many hours were you studying and actually playing (laughs) you weren't out with the cows so what you were doing music how many hours were you like putting in per day oh i'm I probably had the horn in my hand if especially during the summer or you know if I was in school on the weekend because I didn't have anything else to do. I didn't have a car. So I was I was pretty much playing all day. Wow. You know, off and on. But the, you know, the problem with that is back especially for me, <clears throat> I wasn't hip to what I was supposed to be practicing. And at the age of forty three, I'm kind of kind of just not getting hip to what I need to be practicing. So it, it's weird. Like a lot of the times, you know, especially once I got in, in college and I'd go to a practice room, I would just, you know, kind of uh, show off a little bit and play stuff that I already knew, which was pointless, you know. Right. You know, you're practicing in the practice room and if, if you're in there practicing and you sound good and you're probably doing it wrong, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, yeah. I, I often say if you're, you know, you're not making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> right. It's like you're, you're sitting up there. I was sitting up there a lot of the times. Now, when I was in, when I was in high school, middle school and high school, you know, I didn't have that much stuff in my head to, 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 to go off on, to, to actually go, go on. So I was learning a lot, um, you know, learning a couple of skills here and there. But as the the information kind of started getting stored in my in my head, mm-hmm. I would just go through things that I could play already. And so mm. I didn't understand that, you know, practice is not to stroke your ego. Hmm. And that's and that's kind of what I used to do. Um, unfortunately, <clears throat> But uh, now it's like, you know, I'm, you know, just trying to put the pieces together, I guess, you know. So what what types of things do you practice now? You say you're, you're mm. just coming into figuring out what you need to be practicing. What what things yeah. are those? Well, so as a saxophone player, there's, you know, tone exercises like, uh, you know, uh, overtones, mm-hmm. uh, long tones. Uh, of course, scales. I I think the only scale that I actually knew that I really knew, which I hate to say I really knew, because I don't think you can know 
any of this stuff perfectly, you know. Yeah. But the only scale that I actually knew was a major scale. <clears throat> and so <laughs> now I go through all this. I go through, the, you know, the major scale. I go through the minor, or let's see, the harmonic minor, the melodic minor, harmonic major. And I study the, uh, well, we call it the bebop scale, but what Barry Harris calls it is the jazz seven scale and the six diminished scale. So I learned trying to work those. Yeah. I'll go through, uh, like I got a couple of melodic cells. Well, I hate to say a couple. I got some melodic cells that I try to work on to, mm-hmm. for, for f- finger exercises, basically. Mm. And, um, um, you know, just learning songs, learning tunes, you know, depends on what gig I got coming up. If I got to learn some horn lines, because I play in a, you know, a couple of bands where I'm playing horn section. Stuff. Right. But uh, like for this other stuff, you know, learning standards or learning R&B songs, because, you know, depending on what band I'm playing with, I have different roles, you know. Right, so, right. So it just depends. Yeah, so is there... um that there must be a difference, right? So you have your own band called Off the Chain, correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And you guys play, so you are the soloist and the front person in that. But that I'm must the, yeah the the main guy the main guy the guy that uh, that I started this band with is uh, his name is Norris Jones. Mm-hmm. The guy you know he's like my mentor and my big brother. He taught me how to play. He he actually taught me the things. That was mainly, that was mostly important, like how to play with a singer, you know, mm-hmm. how to not get in the way of a singer, you know. Very important cause, skill. <laughs> yeah, because it's like a lot of people don't realize if, you, if you're playing with some, you know, if you're playing alongside or playing in a band and they have a singer, you don't need to be playing all the time while the singer's singing. You know, you need to get out of the way. Mm-hmm. And pick your spot. So I had to learn that, and I learned it from Norris. But uh, but yeah. So in that band, off the chain, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like the I'm like the front man, but the side man also because right. I have my part. I'm I, I have my time to shine, and I have my time to, you know, lay back and and just play my part. Right. Yeah. And that's. Do you find like when you go out on these, because I know some of the corporate bands, um, you're in a band called Creativity and then As Is, are those the mm-hmm. the two? And yeah. then I know you play with Cooper, um, Trent, yeah. Cooper Trent as well. Yeah. So when you go out and you're a part of a horn section, do you guys, do you write all the charts out for them or are they already there or do you guys just rehearse? How does that work? Okay. So I started playing with As Is first and, uh, the, the sister band to them is Creativity. They're, both both bands are owned by the same person, mm-hmm. same people. But when I started out in As Is, uh, you know, I didn't write anything out at first because I was mainly the only <clears throat> horn player. Like, they would just let me go out there and just, you know, play. I would play horn lines, but I would try and play it in a melodic fashion so it don't sound like I'm trying to I'm not playing because you know a horn section, it has a certain certain feel. Like mm-hmm. it, it's very, I hate to say rigid, but it's very, uh, it's like you know precise. You know, yeah, yeah, precise. And so when you're playing a saxophone just in a band, you don't have to stick to that precision so so much. You can you got a little freedom with what you do, but yeah. as uh, I think my second year playing with that band, they added a, a trumpet player. So, uh, you know, I would write stuff out song, but a lot of times, you know, they'll just tell us, <clears throat> they'll tell us what songs we're going to play. And, you know, it's up to us to learn the, the parts, especially if there's a s- specific horn line, you know, just not, cause you know, these are our, these songs are, you know, you're part of a cover band. And so these songs are already hits. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you don't, why, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. (laughs) Right. No, reinvent the wheel. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, don't, don't be so arrogant to think that 
what is already there isn't good enough. So I, you know, I try and like learn the actual horn line. Right. And so people that I, you know, that I play in a horn section with most of the time, they, you know, they try and stick to that also. Now we'll take some freedom with certain things, but if, you know, for the most part, we're going to, the standard is always what's been done before. You right. Know, the, the original recording. So. Right. But I think that's what gives certain horn sections that play together frequently. That's what gives them a certain personality is you mm-hmm. guys know when you're going to take those freedoms and when you're not. Right. Right. And, and a song like so so a song like September by Earth Wind and Fire. Mm-hmm. You gotta play the dog on horn line. That was an epic part, right. you know. So you're gonna learn it and play it, you know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> so that's that, not you know, one you can kind of fool with too much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, first of all, it's it's not an easy one either. So it's like, yeah, you probably need to just learn it and you know, to make you a better <laughs> make it better play if you learn it the right way, you know. So that's one of the songs. I'm going to ask you for a list of songs that everybody should learn and practice. That would be one. <laughs> As, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Any, anything Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah. If you're a horn section, those are know, the tunes not, you go to. <laughs> yeah. If you're not trying, at least trying to do the song justice, you know. Right. And, Right. You know, I, I, I got to respect the music and, and actually respect the artists that did it. You know, these people paved the way for us to do what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. How, how dare you try and uh, change something that doesn't need to be changed? You know. Yeah. Especially yeah. if you can't. You so like I said, the standard is what has been recorded. So I don't think you should. If you can't at least play the horn line to September then, you know, you need to go back in the practice room and, and figure that out. <laughs> Start <laughs> practicing those scales and everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. So you know. what's the difference between, I, I guess maybe that is the difference uh, between playing different styles of music, because when you do jazz, these are, of course, all iconic American songbook songs as well, but solos are vastly different from original early recordings of people that have done them. So is that part of the process in jazz is just being able to have that improvisational thing? Is that part of what the genre requires? I, man, I, I'm still a student, you know, I, I am no expert by any means. So I'm still learning. I think, and this is just my opinion, which, you know, who cares? But I think that uh, you know, when you're when you're learning, when you're studying jazz, I hate to, yeah, when you're studying jazz music and you're learning these solos and there's a there's a language that is that's kind of that's in this music, you know. Yeah. And so I mean it's it's about freedom, but it's actually about the language that has been, you know passed down all these years, you know. Can you dive like, into what that language is a little bit more? Mm, okay, so like my I think my my what I'm really into or what I'm really trying to study is the the bebop language, like Charlie Parker and mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. And so there's certain things that they would do, how they would play lines that is very uh specific to to that you know to that genre right music. right so, and <clears throat> i mean it's it's just a, a matter of listening to it, it, you know your favorite players but listening to that that genre and you know trying to you gotta first imitate it or try and imitate right, it right you know and, and then figure out how to incorporate that into your own vocabulary you know yeah but it's like certain lines that he plays or yeah and everybody back then was different you know you got cats like charlie parker sonny stitt cannonball adderley i mean it's just a, a few alto players but then you got you know sonny stitt was also an incredible tenor player right you know? dexter gordon mm. 
just all these cats, man, they, they had individual voices, but they was all playing the same language, so to speak. It was just they had a different take on, you know. So playing stylistically similar with similar languages, but putting your own words to it? Is that yeah, a good way to say part, it? I, I, I think so, because, you know, like I, I mean, all these guys, I mean, we only we only have 12 notes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. We only have 12 notes in all these these years. We still haven't done it all, you know, which is amazing to me. Just, yeah. We got 12 notes and it keeps I mean, it, you keep finding something new. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's I mean how incredible is that? I mean It's a gift for sure, man. It's, it's mind like, blowing. It's yeah. just mind blowing to me, you know. Yeah. But so these guys, you know, they would uh and I like I said, I'm no expert. I'm I'm trying to I'm still trying to study what bird what Charlie Parker did. <laughs> yeah. He died in nineteen fifty five. Right. Know? Yeah. But it's you know, I'll I, I got so many people that, you know, I'm listening, I'm listening to right now. I'm listening to guitar players. I'm listening to trumpet players. I'm trying to, I'm just trying to put it all together somehow, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think I, I wish this, I wish that I had done this earlier, you know, you know, especially now, you know, we, we, we see these incredible young players coming up on the social media and mm-hmm. like, they're just, playing circles around me and anybody else, you know, but they, they've done the homework, you know, they, they studied all these solos. They learned them in every key. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, like then there's that. <laughs> yeah. Extraordinary work. You, you put in extraordinary work, you're going to wind up being pretty extraordinary yourself, you know? So, well, I think that's the, that's the key right there. And I mean, You've talked about it in, in other interviews I've had. It's the it's the amount of practice and the amount of time and the amount of care and love that you put into whatever you're doing that makes the difference in what comes out of you. Right. You know, you put in the time, you get great stuff out, just like you just said, you know. I do I, think... I the, you know, the, these young kids, they have with the Internet and all that we didn't really have, the opportunity to hear so much more has right. got to make an impact on them, I would think. It had like it has to. They're able to hear everybody doing everything, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, all over the world. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm actually experiencing this in my art as well, you know. I take uh I'm an I'm a visual artist mm-hmm. also. And so I take lessons, I take Skype lessons from this guy in London. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. I mean I take I actually take Skype lessons with saxophone players too, but I, I'm actually taking Skype lessons some uh every once in a while with this uh artist named Kelvin Okafor in London. Uh isn't that amazing uh, that we can do this now? I know. I wish. I mean, I had no idea. I I couldn't do any of this back in the day. You know, I've actually been able to take saxophone lessons with some of my heroes. You know, <laughs> that's cool. Through, through Skype, yeah. Who was your favorite lesson that you got to of your heroes that you got to do? What was that like? Oh, now <laughs> this one, this one. I, I hate to say favorite because okay. <laughs> This, this okay. This is one of my favorites. Okay, I, I went. <laughs> I actually went to. I drove up to Nashville, uh, and got a lesson with Joel Fromm, mm. who is one of my favorite saxophone players of all time. He he recently moved to Nashville from New York. Right. I guess you know after COVID and stuff, but uh, yeah, I actually went to his apartment and had a saxophone lesson with him. Oh man, that must have been cool. Got, it was. I ain't gonna lie. I I was. I mean, I was fanboying. I ain't, I mean, you know, <laughs> I, he even let me uh, like play 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 his saxophone, his tenor. Oh wow! Know? Yeah, that's amazing. 
Yeah, I know. I still study, too. I have a, a vocal coach, Ron Browning, who I study with as often as I humanly possibly can. And we don't even have to be in the same city now. It's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I you know, I, I took Skype lessons with Chad Leftwood Brown for like two or three years. Wow. I've had some Skype lessons with Sam Dilling. And uh, I take Skype lessons right now with Mike Turner, mm. Quamon. Quaman Fowler, you know, my first now my first lesson with him was actually in Texas. Really? I was uh yeah, I you know, I was uh doing a gig in Texas in uh Dallas. And so I was like, man, you know, Quaman Fowler, another one of my heroes, saxophone tennis sax player, call him Texas tenor, you know. <laughs> he lives in the Fort Worth, Dallas area. And the Dallas Fort Worth area, and yeah. uh, I I got in touch with him, and he invited me out to his house, and uh, wow, I, I got a lesson, yeah. So did you just like find him on social media, or what did you do? Oh uh, yes, I think I had his number somehow, and um, yeah, because he 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 he's you know he he doesn't um uh, hide his number from anybody. You can right. just call him, you know. And, uh, you know, I was like, yeah, I want a lesson, man. And he was like, okay, you want to do Skype? I was like, no, I'm in town. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, okay, you can come by the house then. And, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I didn't have my own vehicle out there because I rode out there with the, uh, so I was going out there with As Is. And at mm-hmm. the time, I rode out there with the sound man and his wife that was, you know, doing the sound at the time for, right. for As Is. And uh, I just so happen to have a friend that lives out there. And this friend is not such a safe driver. Oh, no. Wow. But I I had to just deal with it. I'm like, man, I'm getting to this lesson. (laughs) And this this guy drove so fast. Oh, my God. So, I mean, you know, but it was cool. You know, I, I went and got my lesson and. What we do for our art. <laughs> it, yeah, I, I would do it again if I had to. Yeah. You know? I used to do that, too. I used to, when I was on the road, I would find the teacher in town that I, you know, I would just research and talk to people and talk to local singers and find uh, a singer. And I studied in Quebec, Canada for a whole summer uh, with a French-speaking teacher, which was interesting because she didn't speak English and I don't speak French. So (laughs) learning to sing and, you know, I was working in French. So it was just a really interesting summer of study, but I I used to love to do that. That's very cool that you got the chance to work with him. Yeah. Every, you know, any any chance I get, if I'm usually going out of town because, you know, I I live in Troy, I'm from Luverne, but I live in Troy and it's not a whole lot of gigs that I can do here, you know? Right. Um, so I'm usually going out of town. I mean, I travel. So I, <laughs> I saw so I got a, I just got a car and was it 2021? Yeah. The Challenger. I got a RT Challenger RT. Nice. Love this car, you know. Yeah. When I got it, when I first got the car, it had eight miles on it. I drove home today, this morning from New Orleans. And I looked at the mileage, and it was over 70,000 miles on this car. Man, you got to love your... here's the thing. I, I haven't had that car two years yet. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You, you got to love this life because it's a lot of travel, a lot of driving. Where did you sit? You, oh. you were in three different cities just this past weekend. Yeah. So it started out Thursday. I was in Mobile. And I went down the road to uh, Fairhope Friday, which is a you know I think Fairhope is about twenty minutes from Mobile, yeah, something like that. And after after that one, that was Friday. So yeah, Thursday was Mobile, Friday was Fairhope, Saturday well yesterday was uh, New Orleans. Man, and you were home at what time? You said six thirty this morning. Yeah, I got back at six thirty this morning. <laughs> and, and you I, have I a got... rehearsal today at four, right? Yep. <laughs> yep, sure do. There you go, kids. That's your schedule. <laughs> yeah, 
And, That's awesome. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean. So how how did you get? So you're, you know, the the kid in Luverne who's playing sax and arranging for high school bands. How do you get from there into all these bands? Um, how where did you get? Where did you get your first like real band gig and? And then how did you move up and get <laughs> other gigs? And how does all that happen? Well, I was in high school. Uh, I was playing for this gospel group called the Singing Sons of God. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know what I was doing, man. I mean, I really wasn't even get. I was getting a little bit of payment, but the guy that owned the band was like the manager at McDonald's and he used to give me and the drummer who was in high school also, he'd just give us some happy meals and tell us to go on somewhere <laughs> and sit down. But uh that was oh like my, my first <laughs> that was my first gig, you know, um I was playing a it was like a gospel quartet. Right. And so that was like my first experience with playing with actual uh professional musicians. And after that, you know, I went up to, uh, after I graduated high school, I went up to Huntsville to study at Alabama A&M. Mm-hmm. I met some incredible musicians up there, but my time at that school was not so good. So I stayed there for about a year mm-hmm. and uh, went to the Marine Corps after that. <laughs> wow. Yeah. How long were you in the Marines? I was there for about four years. I did an enlistment mm-hmm. and, uh, I was pretty much stationed in Quantico, Virginia uh, Mm. throughout my uh, Marine Corps career. So that the the good thing about that is, I, you know, like I was in the D.C. area. Right. D.C., Maryland, uh, Northern Virginia. And so, of course, one of my first bands in that area, uh, I was in a a go-go band. Oh my. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was in a, I was in a go-go band and I was in also in a, um, like a top 40 band. Wow. Yeah. And so so how did you get, so you moved to the the part of the country where you don't know very many people and no one knows you. How did you get into (laughs) it? I didn't know anyone. (laughs) (laughs) I I got up there and, uh, first of all, I didn't have a car. Oh God. Yeah. I Makes it more difficult. <laughs> yeah. I, I I got my first car and I learned to, I actually learned to drive in DC, which is. Oh horrifying. my God. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I got a, I went to the, uh, it was a, I think, I, yeah, I went to the Mazda dealership in Woodbridge, Virginia. And there was this lady named Darla and she realized that I was from Montgomery. Oh, I'm sorry. She realized I was from Alabama. And she was like, you, so you're a musician? I was like, yeah, uh, I have a, she said, I have a friend of mine who's from Alabama too, and he's a singer in this top 40 band. We ought to get you uh, hooked up with him. Oh, my God. So I was like, really? And just so happens this guy, you know, he's like one of my closest friends now, uh, him and his wife. And, he, yeah, he, he was from Huntsville. And oh, he was wow. Living there. Yeah, he was living up there in in uh, the the Woodbridge area, Woodbridge, Virginia. And so that was my end to the uh, Top 40 band. Now, there was this music store called Mars Music. I don't know if you remember remember Mars Music? Yes, I do. (laughs) Yes, I do. There was a Mars Music in Springfield, Virginia that I used to go to every weekend because they had a bunch of horn, had a bunch of saxophones on the wall and you could just try out a bunch of saxophones and stuff. So I'd just go in there and go in the practice room and just start showing off, <laughs> you know, just being, right. a, being a pretty much being a jerk because I was able to play some stuff that sounded somewhat cool on the saxophone. But it kind of got me a gig. There was this guy named Stan Joyner that walked in to the practice room. And he was like, hey, man, uh, where are you from? I was like, I'm from Alabama. He was like, oh, okay. And uh, he's like, are you? Are you playing in a band? I was like, yeah, I play in a, a band or two already. But he was like, man, I got a, uh, I'm in a go-go band called Soundproof. It's a band called Soundproof Band. Yep. <laughs> and he, 
And he was like, yeah, we we want, we looking for a saxophone player, man. You want to come to our rehearsal? We got a rehearsal in Maryland this week. And I, you know, he gave me the address and, and it was, uh, I was a part of the band after that, you know. Wow. Um, that That's amazing. So from a music store and a car dealership, <laughs> you yeah. get gigs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's I was what... sitting up there. I, I mean, he he was a you know. I still talk to these guys. You know, they actually gave me a nickname. They they, they don't call me Leroy in the DC area. They call me Bubba. Oh no. Yeah, they call me Bubba because, like, you know, I, I guess I got that southern uh... accent. You know, and, I, and it really <laughs> stuck out up there. It's like, man. R- well, right, this. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the north. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. So, you know, and this is what I try and tell my students, too, is that you never know where stuff is going to come from. You know, how could you have predicted that? I was just, you know, just in there playing a horn. They had a, uh, they had a, it wasn't a mark. It was a, it was a new custom Yamaha. And I don't like Yamaha saxophone, by the way, but I don't know. This one was nice and it was pretty, so I wanted to try it out. So I was just in there playing this horn and playing all my all my best licks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, being an arrogant prick pretty much. But uh yeah, I was in there doing that and he came in. He I noticed he like came by a couple of times because you could see like the the door. I closed the door, but there was a window. Yeah. So I could see him kind of looking in there. Yeah, he invited me to their rehearsal and uh, you know, I was, I'm still friends with these guys to this day. Well, that's great. Well, and how did you get from there to, so then you come, did you come back to Alabama after your? Yeah, after the, after the Marines, I got out and uh, <laughs> I I moved to, uh, I got back in touch with Norris and some of my friends, Myron, they got it, you know, Myron Foster and Norris Jones. And <clears throat> we started off the chain. So we we began practicing and getting ready to, you know, just try and go out and start playing gigs. And mm-hmm. I moved, moved back down to uh, the Huntsville area. I was actually living in Decatur, Alabama. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I was working. I got a job at this place called Railroad Bazaar, right? And <laughs> what did you, what 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 yeah, happens so at Railroad this, Bazaar? <laughs> Railroad Bazaar. Okay, so Railroad Bazaar is this store. It started out in Athens, Alabama, right? Okay. So it was a uh, literally a bazaar. It was <laughs> okay. It was pretty bazaar. It had all kinds of stuff. It had like it had musical instruments. It had like little weird. Thing. I mean, it was just, they sold everything in this place. But wow. So there was a, a, a music retail side and a cell phone side. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> so you could, you know, you could go and get you a new guitar for your, for your kid and go get a, a cell phone. This was back when the push to talk was faint, fat, uh, was, you know, they had the little flip phone. Right, stuff, but, uh, right. We all had those. <laughs> 2000. What you? This is 2002. Okay. So I I moved to that area in 2002, and so they the store had started out in Athens, but they they had stores in Huntsville and Madison, Alabama, and I think they even had one down in Auburn, you know, Scottsboro. They I mean they you know had all these real yeah. bizarre stores, and of course they had one in Decatur. So I would go, I would kind of float back and forth. I would go to the, I would work in the. <clears throat> I would work in the Huntsville store. I would also work at the Decatur store and the Athens store. And I would mm-hmm. float between those. And, um, you know, I was a horrible. And when I say I was a absolute horrible music salesman. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. But, I, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I could kind of get by. <laughs> and I'd be tuning guitars and trying to sell some amps or whatever. But uh, I worked for that. I worked for that company. I would say probably two years, two or three years. Yeah, it's about three years. Yeah. No, no, no. No, I'm sorry. It's about two years because so I actually met 
I was able to work with the uh, one of the keyboard players that plays for the Alabama Shakes. You okay. Know, uh, his name is Paul Horton, and uh, we became really good friends. So we would be at the store. He was an incredible keyboard player, so I would bring my horn, and we'd just be sitting there playing <laughs> Plan while we're supposed to be selling product, you know. <laughs> right. Well, and you're... I mean, I was, like I said, I was horrible sales when I, I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, around 2004, my, <clears throat> well, no, at the end of 2003, you know, towards like the very end of 2003, my, my hours were getting cut. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> I got a call from, uh, the drummer that plays that used to play in off the chain. His name is Omari. Mm-hmm. Omari. Uh, Omari Williams. He actually plays for Boney James now. Okay. Wow. But, uh, yeah. But he he called me. He was like, "Hey man, uh, what you doing?" I said, "I'm in this doggone store, wasting <laughs> wasting the bu- time." <laughs> the bizarre. <laughs> yeah, the bizarre world. But That's yeah, right. uh, over here, you know, he's like, "Man, you uh." You wanna you wanna you wanna do a gig? I was like, where? He was like, all over. I was like, what you mean? He's like, man, I'm I'm playing. I got this tour. Uh, we gonna do with Ruben Studded. And you know, Ruben had just won the American Idol and all that. This is 2000. Well, the end of 2003, going into 2004. Okay. At this point, yeah, I think it might have been 2004 already. But but anyway. He he uh he was like, Hey man, I'm gonna let you talk to the keyboard player. The keyboard player said he know you. I was like, Oh yeah. And it just so happened to be Coleman Woodson the third. Oh small well, see, world. See, I, yeah, well see, I had met Coleman. Okay, so let me go back. Uh I met Coleman for the first time in like nineteen ninety five. Mm-hmm. Maybe 94, 95. I was playing, I was the lead alto player at the Allstate Jazz Band, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we were having that Allstate Jazz Band conference in Auburn. And Cole, Coley and his dad, and it was another guy that was with them, they was just there for the concert. Mm-hmm. And so I met Cole, and I met Coley back then. We hit it off. Yeah. I hadn't talked to him since then. Wow. Know? And so... Omar was at the rehearsal with these guys and uh, they was they was kind of brainstorming whether they wanted to use a horn section. It's like, man, we need a saxophone player. And, and Omar was like, I know, I know a guy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's like, man, yeah, his name is Leroy. And so Coley, his ears perked up. He's like, wait a minute, you talking about Leroy Botterford? Like, yeah. And I hadn't seen Coley since 1995. Wow. But he, he remembered me. And so I got that gig because Coley and Omari was like, it's called Leroy. And so it came in at the right time because, like I said, they cut my hours pretty, <laughs> pretty bad. Right. Yeah. I, you know, for, for and it wasn't their fault. I mean, I was, I was, a, I, once again, I was a horrible. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you weren't that bad. <laughs> no, no, I yeah, it's like yeah, they can't. People come in the store like yeah, go ahead and buy something if you want. I <laughs> you know? But no, I mean, it wasn't that bad. But I, 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 I at least had good customer service. But yeah, you know, yeah. I couldn't tell them anything about the product because I just, I just couldn't. But uh, very low so pressure they, sales. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, I was like, hey, I'm here if you need me. Uh, I'll be sitting over here playing this saxophone if you want me to come. <laughs> That's and great. Walk around with you. I can just walk around with you if you want. But, That's great. Yeah, so, they, so they cut my hours back, and uh, but it, it, like I said, it happened at the, the right time because uh, I just pretty much walked away from that job and got on the road, and we toured the U.S. for a good six to eight months. You know. Wow. And again, yeah. you know, who would have ever thought you're working at, you know, Railroad Bazaar, and then. The next day, you're on stage with Ruben Stuttered. Well, the thing was crazy is now back when I was at A and M, Alabama A and M, me and me and Ruben played in a band together. We well, I hate to say we played in a band, but we opened up for Outkast. We really. We, he was a background singer in this particular band. I was playing saxophone, 
And so Outkast was coming to do a concert at Alabama AM. and And uh, they put together a band to open up for for them. Wow. And so we was, you know, he he probably pretend like he don't remember, but it happened. <laughs> I I I got witnesses. You know? <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah. So that was that was crazy. You know, well, I remember rooting from back then. You know, you know. Once again, it just it reinforces what a small community this is. Really, yeah, it really is. You know, and if you are good or great in your case, like you are just amazing, you stand out and people remember you. And plus, you know, you're just a you're a fun guy to hang out with. And, you know, I mean, you, you just got the whole package when it comes to who you're looking for in your band, you know. Well, so thank you. Uh, and I'm going I'm to hold you to that. Uh, <laughs> you know, so when you when you need a saxophone player, don't be, you know. Don't be shy. Oh, you know I'm calling you. <laughs> I, I, you know, playing playing solo guitar. I haven't, uh, <laughs> I haven't done broken right. into you the. Are, yeah, that's, that's right. You 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 playing guitar now, huh? I'm I'm learning. I'm a I'm a newbie. I'm learning the instrument. Yes. <laughs> no, you you you're actually doing gigs on guitar and singing. That's amazing. It's that's uh. Great. It's been a challenge. It's been fun, though. Like you, I mean, I just found sort of a, a renewed passion for music and, you know, a new way to challenge myself, and it's been pretty cool. So I've been learning how to, trying to learn how to play bass, bass ah, guitar. Look at you. That's awesome. Oh, it's, it's, it's not going too well. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nah. Well, if, the worst. if it's anything like my guitar, my guitar didn't go well for quite a while. <laughs> and I started to yeah, go, okay, I'll, well, I at least see some progress, so I'll keep going. <laughs> it, it, it's nowhere near ready for public consumption, my, my skills on bass. It just, it, yeah, it's, it's horrible. But <laughs> I, I, I keep practicing, you know. Well, you ever you got you to gotta start somewhere, right? <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do? Well, um, what uh, if you had advice for some students, um, some young kids coming up playing that want to get in bands and want to do what you're doing? I mean, basically, how many days a, a year do you play? Uh, I've just now started playing with another group. So, And this guy in particular, he plays... Sometimes he 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 has some gigs on some Thursdays. So every week I'm usually busy from Thursday to Sunday. Wow, that's a lot. That's on yeah. That's and you know I yeah I mean like okay so I got my calendar I got my giant calendar here I'm looking at mm -hmm. and so this coming week is kind of gonna kind of well I hate to say a light week but so I got the rehearsal today. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'll be kind of free, but um, I have a gig in Birmingham on the thir on Thursday. I'm playing in Montgomery on Friday, and I I got a gig on this Saturday, but I'm not sure where it is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Should probably find that out. <laughs> I, oh yeah, yeah, I, I, will. <laughs> I will. But I have a uh, I have another thing that's going on Sunday in Montgomery and then I have a gig on Monday in Montgomery so wow yeah so I mean it just depends it, it fluctuates like yeah that week that week after that I'm just gonna be doing a gig in uh Moultrie Georgia but the next week I got a big band not not a big band thing it's like a jazz kind of jazz festival thing that I'm doing cool 26th and 27th and then I got two gigs on on a Saturday, like the 29th. I got two gigs in one day. One in yeah, they're gonna both be in Birmingham. So, uh, I got you know I got my work cut out somewhat. That's a that's a good schedule you got there. So how what would you say to young students who want to be doing what you're doing? Uh, uh. Don't. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised I, I would, how much I hear that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because cause here's the thing, you know, there's there's good days and bad. Well, there's good 
there are good days, there are good bad days, there are good years and bad years, you know. Right. Um, when I when I first moved back to this area from uh from the Huntsville area, I mean I wasn't gigging as much, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started going to school. I went to Troy University for a while. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I had to just get back out there. And, you know, I started going to some of these jam sessions and just, you know, trying to keep in touch with musicians that was doing what I wanted to do. Right. And so when the time came for a saxophone player to miss his gig or for somebody to call me, you know, in need of a saxophone player, I was there. You know, I was on time. You know, I I didn't cause any trouble. I did what I was supposed to do and, and, and tried to go above and beyond what was required of me, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, that's the thing. I mean, I just try and just have some integrity to what I'm doing, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, that's such an important piece, going above and beyond. And it is who you present yourself. And we talked a little bit before we started recording about branding, but that is your brand, you know? I mean, people know what they're going to get when they hire you. Like you said, you Mm -hmm. you provide all those things and everybody knows that that's a you're a reliable entity when they hire you. You're going to go above and beyond and play and be there on time and know your stuff and they can count on you. And that's really important. And that is part of the brand that is you. Well, thank you. So, I mean, yeah. well, I mean, you're you're the one that's done it. You know what I mean? It's hard work, and you did it, and you, you know, clearly have built this name for yourself and are, you know, busy now because of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm fortunate, uh, especially, but, you know, especially living in Alabama. Uh, I'm living in Troy, Alabama. I'm a saxophone player able to make a living, which is crazy. Yeah. Because... I mean, I like I said, I don't the close I don't I never really have a lot of gigs around this area, but so you know, you gotta have a really a dependable car and, and if you don't have a dependable car, you you know, just pray a lot because <laughs> there were times <laughs> there were times that I, you know, didn't have such a dependable car. I remember I was coming back from uh Texas and uh I have drove over to mississippi and got in a, another vehicle with some other guys we drove out to texas came back i got back in my car was driving from mississippi to here and on my way i think it was a, what's that road uh from like miss uh it's like from uh selma that road is it 82 is it mm, i don't I know, know. It's a it's a road that you don't want to be stranded on. Oh no, one of those roads. <laughs> yeah, I got stranded, man. Late night, it was late, and um, I had to just pull over and just sit there, and wait on the you know the tow truck Oof. come pick me up. You know, so there there are those days, you know. Yeah. But you you just gotta if you love it and you you know you feel because I feel like. As much as sometimes I can kind of hate these these wedding gigs and these corporate gigs and get annoyed with things, I also know that I'm blessed to be able to do what I'm doing. I'm actually playing a part in somebody's special day, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a and it, I mean, it's, you know, these are these are wedding receptions, but man, that's that's somebody's memory, you know. Mm-hmm. So I want to try and 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 present the best. Thing that I can, you know, that I can bring to the table for every last one of those, you know. That's beautiful. That's that's a really great way to think about, you know, what you're doing. You are you are spreading joy and happiness, and what could be better than that, you know? And love. I mean, we need we need that right now, you know, more so than ever. Yeah, you know? you, you are right. You are right. Well, am I forgetting to ask you anything or is there any other tips or any any other advice, uh, any other takeaways, you know, that you might have told your younger self or things that you wish uh, you'd done or things that you I, shouldn't have done? <laughs> I, will, I will do this. I will tell your students to listen to Jilla. Oh, 
Listen, make sure you listen to her because she knows what <laughs> she knows what the hell she's talking about. Uh, thank you, my friend. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's that's one hundred. But uh, I mean, I think we just try and be open to 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 being the best that we can be. You know, I'm I'm not trying to be better than anybody out there. I'm just trying to be better than I was yesterday. And I know that's kind of cliche, but it's Lord Lord knows that's the truth. That is. Like, that's, Yep. That's my truth. And um, I'm just going to continue to do that, you know. Well, that's I think, amazing. I think we all should, should try and strive for that, just strive for better, you know. Yeah. Well, Leroy, thank you. This has been an absolutely amazing chat. Thanks for your time. I know you have to get ready and go to your rehearsals, so I don't want to keep you all day. <laughs> Although we could talk for more hours than, <laughs> than this one for sure, but... Thank you so much. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll have a, have a great rehearsal and I will talk to you soon. All right. Have a good one. All right. Thanks for joining us today. You know, building your best life and career is about finding balance in everything you do. So build your life on purpose and you'll find success, happiness, and peace. And remember, whatever stage you're on today, walk with purpose.